that thing that you might be doing and your instructor's been saying all the time, you hear it slightly from somebody else just a little bit differently, all of a sudden goes click and you're able to now perform it. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Whistlegag Martial Arts Radio, episode 328. And today, I'm joined by Sifu Scott Grainer. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. And I started this company because I love traditional martial arts. And I wanted to bring stuff, content, video, audio, products to the other traditional martial artists. And honestly, everything we make is stuff that I wanted to see. Stuff I wanted to use, I wanted to hear. And that's kind of the root of this show. If you want to check out our episodes, you can find them at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got a ton of good stuff over there with show notes, transcripts, video, photo, links. Just a lot of great stuff to help give you more context for our guests. Or if you're listening to a topic episode, which we do on Thursdays, usually a profile of a, of a style or a person that maybe has passed away, you can find all kinds of great context. You know, we bring a lot of good stuff in there just to help you understand because the martial arts is deep. There's a lot going on there because we're talking about people and people are deep. Let's talk about today's person, today's guest, Sifu Scott Grainer. I've known Sifu Grainer, I, honestly, I don't know how long I've known him. He doesn't live too far away. He runs a martial arts school. This is Vermont. And let's face it, Martial arts is already a pretty tight-knit community. Martial arts in Vermont, everybody knows everybody, because even outside of martial arts, everybody knows everybody. But I've always liked this man. I don't know him that well. I've been fortunate enough to get to know him a bit better over the past few years, to train with him. And recently, he welcomed me into his home so we could sit down and chat. And that's the conversation that you're about to hear. We talk about a lot of different stuff from his origins in the arts to, honestly, my favorite subject, what makes him tick. So let's hang back and you can listen to my conversation with Sifu Scott Grainer. Sifu Grain, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much. It's an honor being here. Yeah. This is cool. We've been, we started talking about this, what, a couple years ago? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> Having yeah. you on and it just, it just hasn't happened, which is funny. It's because it, you live 45 minutes away. I know. From not too far. Like it's not, <laughs> you're not far away at all. And, and, and I don't know. I, I think that's, that's always the way. I have friends mm -hmm. that I moved to Vermont after college and they stuck around. They, you know, like I'm thinking one in particular, he went to St. Mike's. And I think in the two years I was here, this is one of my best friends from high school. We, I think we saw each other twice and he moved back to Maine. And now I see him like four or five times a year. <laughs> Makes no sense. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Sometimes uh, the closer you are, the less you see people. I don't know yeah, how it's, that it's ends almost up. like yeah. you take it for granted. Like, oh, they're just over there. You know, I'll, I can see them tomorrow. <laughs> then it gets the next day, the yeah. next day. Yeah, but, doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But we're here now. But, but we're here now. Yeah. 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 I'm yeah. excited. And, you know, I've got to be honest. I know a little bit about your lineage. I don't know a lot about how you got started or anything. I, I, th I think you moved here from somewhere else. I think I heard that mm -hmm. somewhere along the way. So let's just, let's, let's roll back and talk about how you got started martial arts. Yeah. So I started when I was five and, okay. um, I, I remember that my best friend at the time started at a karate school. Now, technically, it was a Kempo school, but, you know, all the signs back mm. in that time, everything right. said karate, because karate kid. Right. And um, <laughs> so we, uh, we got to, I was five, and um, we were at the, this movie store. So uh, right next, it was in like a plaza. So there was like, next is VHS. <laughs> right. <laughs> Old rental movie store. And um, there's this karate place next door. And my, my best friend just started there. He just turned five. I was like, that was the cutoff. You had to be five in order to start. And um, so for my birthday, that was kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm going to start karate. My, my dad saw the introductory price is like 20 bucks for the month. And he was like, oh, this is going to be so simple. He's not going to want to do this at all. And, and uh, that was the beginning of a journey. And he thought it was going to be the 20 easy dollars that turned into <laughs> almost 28 years of a training. Lot, so, a lot, yeah. Yeah. so that was 
my beginning and um yeah we we had a my 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 friend stuck with it for a couple of years and i just kept going just kept kept training and fell in love with it and became my passion really why did you want to do it so you know you have kids and yeah and i've spent enough time with with young kids at five you don't really know what you want right? like I, I just think it was one of those like oh this is like the movies and ninja turtles sure. was big at the time too so it was like oh i get to you know and they had like swords in the window and all that kind of stuff. It was just the whole I'm gonna be idea. Leonardo. Yeah, I'm gonna be Leonardo. I love Leonardo. Yeah, <laughs> and it's so cool because my son's like way into Ninja Turtles right now. Nice. So it's kind of like full circle, which is neat. But, Ninja Turtles are great. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think it was just the, the whole idea that my friend was doing it. Mm. I needed to do it too. And it was what I was seeing in like the the movies and the, all that kind of stuff. And it had that idea of play almost. And. Yeah, my dad was a music teacher, and uh, he taught in high school. And so I was always watching his performances and shows, and basically grew up around that kind of stuff. So there was almost this like sense of like ceremony and and not I don't want to say show, but like you know you put on the gi, you and and you're training and you're, all, you're doing this ritual that goes back in time, and and that right. that appealed to me. I think right. I think that's kind of where it started. The, the seed was planted. <laughs> makes sense. It yeah. makes sense. I, you know, I can certainly see the the, the correlation in in that the presentation yeah. of it certainly between music and, and martial arts and you know we've had we've had a number of, of people on who have confessed to having some musical ability <laughs> or, or, or enjoyment of being in front of a crowd in that way. Yeah. As well, are you musical? Yeah. Yourself? Yeah, that was one of the kind of choices I had was. Do I pursue music more mm. or do I pursue the martial arts more? And, and pursuing the martial arts was kind of my, my dream. And that kind of took over. I, I did music throughout high school. Everybody thought I was going to go into some kind of music related field. Interesting. Um, but instead, you know, this is, this is kind of where my heart was. <laughs> and then uh, I enjoyed music. I wasn't a great musician. Everything was, um, I could read music. I was the number two vocalist in the state of Connecticut um, uh, for all state and like a couple of years. <laughs> and um, that was really cool. I was decent. I'll just say I was decent yeah. at it, but a lot of it was through ear. A lot of it was through hearing and I didn't practice it. Mm. I didn't, it just came naturally. Whereas martial arts, I practiced. I was, it wasn't something I was gifted with. I wasn't gifted physically with it. I worked at it. And, and that's, that's, that's the opposite of what you would think would happen. Yeah. Most people that are really good at something, that's the thing that they're going to go after, not the thing that they don't have a gift for. Oh, yeah. I, for the Were most you part, aware of that? Yeah, I was completely aware. Like it's When really I would go to like um, these all-state music festivals, we'd do these kind of almost like a training. It, it, it would be, you'd be there from the morning to nighttime, Practicing, 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 working as a group, singing, mm. doing your thing. I also played musical instruments as well, but um, that didn't excite me. What excited me in the music realm is more of the creativity, mm. you know, how, how the music is created and developing your own music. That excited me. So I was in a, a rock band in high school and you know, yeah. <laughs> that kind of stuff. And that excited me more. Um, and performing it was exciting, but sitting there and really kind of diving into the practice of it, that, that made it dry for me. Mm. And I, I didn't like the feeling of music being dry. And because I, I, I love creating music, I don't like the idea of killing that passion with, with killing the practice, so to speak. Sure. You know, um, I didn't want it to become my job. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Whereas martial arts was, you know, from that early age of five, I was practicing and dedicating a lot of time to it. And um, my instructors would often call me a dojo rat. I'd, I'd be there all the time. Yeah, yeah it's definitely <laughs> and, a term and, that we've kicked around on the yeah, show. People know that, <laughs> know that phrase. It was one of those things where I think the the work ethic was already in place. So continuing that and, and wanting to pursue that as, as work was just natural. It was how, how I developed it. Now, how does the, the 
resistance to the structure of music, how does the pushback on that get flipped into, let's face it, traditional martial arts is about as rigid a pursuit as you get. Yeah. Um, I was lucky also that for the most part, my martial arts schools, yeah, they they had the tradition behind it. They had um, some of the ceremony behind it. But it wasn't like complete militaristic. Um, There's a little bit more free flow and, and conversation between the instructors and the students, which was which was so that was that was nice that I was in that kind of martial arts environment, um, and it allowed for a little bit of creativity. And um, I, I see a strong parallel between the music and the martial arts um, as far as the idea of feeling. I I find that you. Can, if you work on your martial arts and you're just doing movements and you're just doing kicks and punches and maybe somebody's telling you something um, or telling you how to do it, that's one thing. And that's okay. That's great. But then you want to be able to feel it. You want to be able to be able to express the underlying idea or intent behind what you're doing. Mm. And so... You know, feeling and expression in music and feeling and expression in, in your techniques, your forms, your katas, whatever it is that you're doing, I can see that correlation. Absolutely. Yeah. I can see, I can see that as well. Now, is that something, this is, a, this is a subject that personally I'm really interested in, so I'm mm-hmm. curious your, your thoughts. Is that expression, is that something that you can foster? Because, of course, you have a school, you have students, you have quite a few students and a lot of kids. And yeah. Kids are, are, I think most people would agree, a little more moldable <laughs> if, you can, if you can reach them in the right way than yeah. adults. Is that, is that, exp- that ability to express, mm-hmm. is that something that you can, you can kind of pull the strings on? Or, or is it like your musical ability? Is it just innate and you accept it for what it is? No, I think you can pull the strings on it. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like what, when, when an instructor says something over and over and over again, mm. and then that's, you know, the student might not get it at that point, but then all of a sudden a year later, two years later, five years later, all of a sudden that light bulb goes off yeah. and it clicks and you're like, why didn't, I, why didn't I think of that before? <laughs> and it's like, it's been said how many times before that? And that's totally, totally the way I feel about um, that expression in, in your art form, it's not going to be overnight. A white belt's never going to be able to do a kata with the expression of, of somebody who's been there and has more experience. It's, that's through the training. That's through the practice, mm. through the development of the person. Mm. Um, but I think also seeing it, if I've, I've had instructors before that you've never, you've never seen them really do their kata you've never seen them do their techniques you've never seen them spar and they just exist in kind of uh, you know they lead in front of the class and you know that's okay you can you can get a lot out of that but there's an inspiration that happens when you see your instructor do something at a certain level um, which is kind of neat and is there any other hobby pursuit academic whatever where we accept that we just I, I, we just blindly <laughs> accept this person says they know what they're doing and never demonstrates their ability, but we say okay, and we maybe do po- what they maybe, tell maybe, us. Maybe in politics, but that's about it. But we're not going to oh, go there. Oh, we're not going there. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, we could totally have like a sideline show because we 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 flirt with the with the, that subject because there is there is a a political element. Yeah. In martial arts, isn't there the idea that, that, well, just watch all the people that break away from other people and, mm-hmm. and, and people getting hurt and offended. And, and I was sharing an anecdote with you prior to us recording about something that not quite political, but here martial artists that should know better on something getting really hurt and offended and walking away. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where a lot of times we put our ego way too far in front of us and... I think really the heart of martial arts is, is I mean, if, if you have a big ego and, and you're getting 
punched all the time while you're sparring, you're going to have a problem when you're sparring because <laughs> that tends to escalate and, and turn into bad sparring practice. And a lot of times those people that get ticked off either just don't train at that level. You see them leave. You yeah. see them not do it. But um, you have to keep your ego in check a little bit. How do you do that? How do you do that? And, and, and let me preface why, why I asked that question. Um, you've been training yeah. virtually your whole life. Mm -hmm. you, you run a successful school. Um, you know, we're sitting in your home. It's, it's a beautiful home. You've clearly achieved some success in that way. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, I've, I've watched some of your students. They're skilled. They're skilled as a teacher. And you've accomplished these things at a younger age than most. Your, your, your rank versus your age um, would, would seem out of place to a lot of people, but I've also, I've worked with you and, and I've mm -hmm. seen your students and I know that it is not, you know, and I, and I know, I know your Kempo instructor and I know that he doesn't just like throw belts around, you know, when you throw money around. Yeah. Right. So, so I, I see that. So I think you're a good person to speak on this subject because you very well could have ego problems. But just we've had enough conversations that, that if you do, you do a great job of hiding it, which I, don't, <laughs> I, I think in and of itself would show that if you, that you don't have an ego problem, right? Even if you did have some and you said, oh, I'm working on this, I'm not going to express it, that, that's almost the same thing. Yeah. You know, I, I, I look at the martial arts training, at least the way that I've we didn't, we didn't get into anything about like who I feel my, my teachers are. I've had a lot of teachers. When I, when I first started, when I started at five, I think my school went through like several, three or four teachers within the first year or two. Wow. It, was, it was one of those things where I had a great probably teacher that was there for about a year mm -hmm. and uh, maybe two years. And he was great. Then all of a sudden I went through this, this turmoil in the school and because and, and, he, he left to go do something else. And we ended up with like five or four or five teachers in one very short amount of time. And Sounds like politics. It, yeah, there, there, there was politics. And, yeah. and finally, it ended, when the dust settled, basically the, the person who, who took control of the school at that point was the person, um, his name was uh, uh, Master Jay Van Schell. And he, he kind of tech, took the helm of the school at that point. Mm. And um, that was when all of a sudden things changed for me. As far as I was really into the martial arts, I did well in the school, but things changed tremendously for me as a martial artist when he took kind of a hold of school and, and, and um, he had a lot more, even though we were doing Kempo, he had a lot of um, Tai Chi background mm. as well. So I, I, he, when he came into the school, I was already maybe, I think it was either like, uh, um, in our school it goes green and then brown. So um, I was either a green belt or a brown belt at the time. So I was already getting, getting closer to black belt. Mm -hmm. And within that year, I did some competing from purple belt through that point. I never have won anything at any tournament up to that point. And then with his training, with his tutelage, we were able to really refine my skill. And um, I, after, after the, I think it was the first tournament that I went to, as he was my instructor, I got like first place in, in the tournament. And, and he saw the potential that I had. And, and he knew how to reach you. And, and he knew how to reach me. And he fostered that. And again, it came back to also when I was saying that being able to demonstrate something, I, I learned really well by seeing how it's supposed to look. Right. And I always get inspired by those that do a really awesome job at expressing themselves and expressing the art as it's supposed to be done. Um, that inspires me. So when I see that, that's how I want to be. And I, it's kind mm -hmm. of like I copy that. Yeah. And it's a good good way to get there initially and then of course later on you have to kind of develop yourself and your own style within it but it allows you to see where it could go yeah. and um he fostered a lot of ideas because of his tai chi background um breathing 
we incorporated qigong into class. I mean, this is as this is as a kid. I'm yeah. doing doing qigong poses and breathing exercises and meditative exercises. And I think if it wasn't for that component that was in my training, um, or maybe just martial arts training in general, I would have been a totally different person. Mm -hmm. um, I know my initial reaction to to um, getting upset, heated under the collar, um, is normally not a good reaction. <laughs> I know uh, my dad always jokes that the grainer side of the family tends to be um, quite explosive with things like that. <laughs> um, and, you know, he has some interesting stories about being a kid and, you know, his parents and with very explosive personalities. Mm. But um, it's one of those things where when I feel that, I have some training to go back on. Um, if I'm feeling heated under the collar, I, I can kind of manage that a little bit and and um, yeah. use some of the techniques that I've learned along the way. I think I, I wouldn't be as even keel mm. without my training. Now, that's a subject that, you know, I got to say, you're, you're going to be episode 300 and whatever. Mm. And I don't know that we've covered the subject of children and I, I, know, I know a lot of folks struggle with using this term, but I've, I've yet to come up with a better one, you know, softer arts or internal arts. Mm -hmm. And certainly here's an example. You're, you're saying that not only was it, was it okay, but you think it was pretty important as you grew as a person, as a martial artist. I think it was, yeah. I've done a small amount of Tai Chi, of Qigong, mostly at seminars, you know, so it's, mm -hmm. you know, presented in a very condensed form, you know, yeah. single outcome, you know, maybe you're, you're going over short form for 45 minutes, you know, not, not a lot of stuff. Was it presented kind of in that same way that adults would learn or was it? Yeah, well, and that's, that's part of the, and I've always had this issue with some of my, my own practice is that when I, when I learned things, I learned it in an adult atmosphere. Mm. Um, at that point, I was, you know, I was on the cusp of when oh, that, that big martial arts bubble of kids was happening. So behind me was this giant bubble of kids. Yeah. And everything became very kid-friendly. Let's talk, you know, that, mm, that became yeah. a push. Um, ahead of me were, and this is like when I was eight, nine, ten. Ahead of me were these teenagers that were 16, 17, 18, and then some adults, and they all grew up basically karate kid, pre-karate kid, okay. much more traditional, much harder training. I was square in the middle of that. So instead of me being bumped down, I was in the bumped up and was working with these older, much more mature teenagers and adults yeah. and so i was experiencing kind of that level of what the class was um even though i was much younger and to get my black belt at the time um i had to work at an adult level i was expecting even though i got my black belt fairly young and i, yeah. I know most people are going to be listening to this and going yeah. "Ooh, you know we're, we're, do, we're all doing the math you we're know going. like an 11 year old black belt that's kind of young um yes but I was required to do things with adults and at an adult level. Right. Um, I remember, I still remember his name and it wasn't like we were friends. He was just a great training partner. He was a senior in high school. And it was as I was a brown belt and I was getting closer and getting ready for my, my black belt. So he was like a good foot and a half taller than me, bigger dude yeah. at the time. And um, he wouldn't make the techniques easy for me to do. If I was to, to do a sweep or takedown, he would put some resistance behind it so that I would have to really actually apply it. Mm. And, and that was kind of like the lesson was, I'm not going to let you just take me down. It's I'm going to actually make you have to do this at a level that you should be to be able to do a black belt. It was, right. it was, there was an expectation that I had to be able to do what everybody else was doing at an adult level. And I'm thankful for that because I think that's what a black belt should be. I don't think there should be, um, you know, 
this is what the adults are doing and this is what the kids are doing, but they still equal the same belt. If that right. makes sense. It, it does. It does. And certainly the, the notion of adult versus junior black belts mm-hmm. is a hotly debated topic and, and yes. probably one of the hottest, right? definitely top three <laughs> in, in, my, in my experience yeah. when, when you get martial artists together. But I think that you kind of hit the nail on the head there, the idea that if you are going to have a junior black belt, it mm-hmm. is seen as different. I mean, I, I've, I've met, you know, 13-year-olds with eight stripes on their belt, but everybody knows this is a junior black belt. I mean, eighth degree junior, <laughs> junior. black belt, which is still <laughs> subordinate to a first degree adult black belt. And the moment that I am of whatever that age standard is, I will retest under the new standards. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some people might say, why bother? Why have that? I would counter that the majority of those people have never run a school and the economics of those decisions have never come into play. And I totally understand that. And this is, you know, I always, as a school owner, I always have to kind of weigh and balance things between every school has its own philosophy and its own way of doing things. Whether, you know, it's from uh, being a strict, very structured, um, militaristic you know, style to kind of meeting in your backyard. (laughs) You know, you have such a wide range of what a martial arts school could be. Um, And you have to find what fits you and what's right for you. Now, for us, I kind of hold to, 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 to what I grew up with. And so all of our students that are going for black belt, whether they are, we haven't had anybody that's not a, you know, a young teen, but anybody who's a young teen or yeah, that's kind of the youngest we've had, has to do still what the adults do. And I've actually had the opposite. I, when people ask like, oh, well, they have to be like 16 or they have to be 18 to get their black belt. I've had a 13, 14 year old who can outperform my 30 and 40 year olds. Sure. No doubt. And that blows my mind sometimes, but it also is one of those things like, I don't think age is the determining factor. It's really the skill of the person. Yeah. Um, and I also have uh, a 14 year old who can bench press 200 pounds. I mean, <laughs> it's, yeah, he, I mean, he's a beast. Yeah. <laughs> so it's one of those things like, I don't think that that, that age is, is the deciding factor. You, you know when somebody's a black belt. You know. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And that was something that. You know, they're, they're, I, I think one of the reasons that we get along and that, that I've always enjoyed our conversations as, as infrequent as they've been mm-hmm. is that I think our upbringings were fairly similar. I remember my original instructors, you know, we would, we would have conversations about rank and, and they, always, they always said, you know, we will promote slowly, we'll always promote slowly. No one will ever question your rank because we hold a very high standard. But our testing as you got further along with the exception of black belt became less structured. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, this was a a traditional karate school and three degrees of brown belt. There, there was no test for, to move from third to second, second to first. It was a designation. And we would ask about that. And same thing for black belt. You would test for your showdown, but then second on up was a, was a designation. Mm-hmm. Well, h- how can we do that? Because you know. And you might not always understand that when you're early on in martial arts, but I mean, you attend events and, yeah. and tournaments and you look around and you can tell that person was promoted fast. That person's due for promotion now, you know, right? Like you can yeah. see, because it's not just in their in their technique; it's in their conduct. It's the way they operate in the world. Mm-hmm. I've had people guess that I'm a martial artist just because of the way I I conduct myself with them, especially if they are also a martial artist. Oh yeah, yeah. And I, I've I've had it also where you know I I, I can sometimes tell which parents have had martial arts experience. Mm previous to their their kids signing up or something with us just by our interactions yeah you it, it's it's something you carry with you how you how you conduct yourself how you carry that um and, and approach approach your life sometimes you a lot of times will translate well yeah. I, I think for the majority of people who have, have studied martial arts that's true um but yeah i mean i i've i've gone through um what i don't think we've 
we've discussed is I, I was in the Kempo school with my, with Master Van Schelt for, for many years, all the way through high school. I was, I was there, but he left after like four or five years. Okay. So um, you had to transition instructors again. Again, which, um, it's hard. That is so hard. And especially it's on so a kid. Hard. It sounds like you really looked up to him. Oh yeah. You know, and, third and, parent in yeah, a sense. Exactly. And, and, um, we, um, we, we connected several times after that, but he, he went on to really just continue pursuing the, the internal arts mm. and um, making that the, his primary objective and um, sharing that both in the medical field and um, in, his, in the uh, public field as well. Yeah. Um, but we were, we were um, building a house in Vermont, um, and this is when I was in sixth grade, so I don't remember what age that is off the top of my head, but what is that, like 12 or something like that? Yeah. Um, so we were building a house in Vermont, and, um, you know, what would I do without without doing martial arts for two or three months while we were up in Vermont for the whole summer? My parents were both teachers, so um, they had the summers off. And we, we went up to Vermont, and um, we're going to be building this place. We decided that we needed to to do something about my martial arts training. So it just happened that there was going to be a seminar with my current instructor, who was Master Van Schell at the time, and this sparring seminar at the same thing. He was doing forms and kata, and, and then um, another seminar was on sparring, and it was Master Van. Hmm. And so just by happenstance, it was that I met Master Lepan through the seminar, and he was in the same style, same system as us, and it was, okay, he's, what, 40 minutes away from where we were building at the time, and we're going to now travel multiple times a week and do class all summer long with Master Lepan, and that, that you know, Freddie Lepan became my mentor, who I now, you know, I see him weekly to this day. Cool. And um, it's interesting that, you know, I don't often go out and like, oh, I need to go train with this person. Then I need to go train with this person. Then I need to train with this person. A lot of it kind of just happens yeah. naturally. And, um, oh, this opportunity presents itself. So I, I go that way if I choose to. When the student is ready. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a cliche, it. but it does it, seem to line up. It really does. And I've just been so lucky to have some great instructors in the process. Mm. And then at the same time, when Master Van Schell ended up leaving our school, so that was kind of another transitional moment. What do I do? <laughs> you know? Um, and at the exact same time, um, Master Hu Chong moved um, to Connecticut, where I was, mm. about half an hour away. And it was in the papers that this uh, Chinese wushu master was moving to, you know, just moved to the area. And he was in Kung Fu Magazine and huge page articles about him. And that's still kind of the earlier days of Wushu in, in the U.S. Yeah, it was like, um, this was this was like, uh, I think, 1999 by the time this happened. And especially so on I was the already, East Coast. Yeah, I was already a black belt in Kempo at that point and, and um, competing and doing like the NASCA stuff and mm. um, uh, the crane tournaments in New England yep. and stuff like that. And... Um, Things started getting. I I, I know that uh, John Stork was on, and I yeah I trained. I you know John John and I were buddies. We trained together at Max Lepan, Lepan Studio, um, and we we just we just worked we worked together so great. And uh, like Dylan Abair was another one who was on on the extreme team, and <laughs> we mm -hmm. we all competed together, and it was it was it was a good time, good bonding. You know, I I look back at those moments and and. Um, it's great when you have such a great team you can bond together um, and it becomes more than just just training in martial arts it's yeah. it's kind of that's your friend core <laughs> yeah. you know um, which as a, as a teenager as a higher uh, ranked teenager yeah I mean there's there's nothing more I think that you can do to keep mm -hmm. teens in martial arts than building that core building that that nucleus exactly yeah to, to pull them back in as they start to drift out because their friends are there mm-hmm and I think that's the cool part is, you know, because I start so early, I get, I, I get the early perspective. I understand being a kid that's five, six, seven in the martial arts. I've been there, you know, but I also understand the, 
the frustrations and, and draws that sometimes, you know, make you all of a sudden not do the martial arts. I, I understand that. Um, but then I also, I, I, I went through the whole teenage thing and that, that between that group, the extreme team with, uh, under Freddie the pan and, and, um, then I, I started Wushu and, um, I eventually got on onto their team, their competition team. And, um, that, that crew, that group was really kind of close knit, mm. great family of people. And, um, that allowed me to do so many different opportunities through them, which is fantastic. Cool. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I met master who, and, um, it's like, just when you think you know something, because I studied, you know, I was competing with both staff, both staff is my thing. Yeah. Um, and just when you think you know something, go try something just slightly different, <laughs> right? Go try something slightly different and see how much you know that. Because <laughs> it completely changes your understanding. You know, I, I, look, at, I look at the martial arts. Th- th- Master Van Schelt used to talk about tree, right? You have your your trunk of your tree, that's your main style. And I am I consider myself a Kempo martial artist. That's that's what I do. You know? Um, everything else is branches off of that. Now you might have small little twigs, but you might have, you know, thicker branches that are there. And those those branches are what else you do. And they give you insight to your Kempo or to your martial art, your core. Um, so I look at like my studying of Wushu, my studying of Tai Chi as a lens to look at my Kempo through. Mm. It changes how I look at it, if that makes any sense. It, it does, yeah. and I, I, I particularly like that analogy. I've never heard that analogy before, but as I'm, I'm kind of playing it out, if I imagine a tree, and you know, you, you think about any tree, any tree that's been around for a while, and you get these little branches that come off in, the, in these tiny places, and they don't need to be there. The tree won't die without them. Mm-hmm. But even if it's a tiny amount, that tree is healthier because of the nutrition, the light that's coming in through those leaves. Yeah, yeah. This I is. That. It's one of those things where I'm totally okay with people learning different martial arts. But you need your base. If you don't have a base, you have no reference point. You know, you can, if I do a year of Taekwondo and then a, a year of Kempo and a year of Kung Fu, year of kickboxing, yeah, you're, it's, it's cool. You're going to learn a lot, but you don't necessarily have a base yet to yeah. do it through. Yeah, you'd be better off in most cases doing three years of one mm-hmm. and a year of another. Yes, yeah. Because that three years is going to give you enough that you can start to gain some perspective and start to understand, here's what I like, here's what I don't like, and to switch gears. And I'm sure you're able to switch gears between Wushu and Kempo yeah. because you have enough time working each. I can switch gears from, you know, from, from Shotokan to kickboxing to Taekwondo to... Kempo to whatever because mm-hmm. I've had the time I've had a lot of time in on these other things and I can also put them all together yeah I can I can you know smash them together into Jeremy Fu and teach you what seems to work well for me that I've pulled from all those mm-hmm. but if you came to me and said teach me Ishin Ru I could push all that aside yeah and and, and I think that's, I think that's great. I, I love being able to, to see the different styles, understand the differences. One of the things that I, and this is just my own belief and my own thought. This so, whole episode so, is so, your, and, your beliefs and your that's, thoughts. That's right. Anybody can take this any way they want to take it. Um, I, I love Bruce Lee's quote, which about, um, it's like a finger pointing at the moon or pointing away to the moon. If you stare at the finger, you'll miss all of its heavenly glory. I even have that on my website. I like that so much. I put that on my website. And I know that that's not really just a Bruce Lee quote. I mean, that goes back to 
you know, Chan or, or Zen Buddhism. Mm. And you can just keep pushing that backwards. And, you know, for, for those that are in the Chinese martial arts with, um, you know, if we can go back to the Shaolin Temple, that's basically the histories and origins of Chan and uh, Chan, which eventually, you know, becomes Zen Buddhism. Mm. And that whole idea of, are we missing the point? <laughs> you know, are we so focused on the finger, this style, and doing it this specific way? And then that this finger over here that's also pointing at the moon is something else, another style. Mm. And we just have all these fingers pointing at the moon, but we're so focused on the finger, we're missing the whole point altogether. Yeah. And so when I'm looking at the martial arts, I really look at what's similar. What can I pull? What 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 is the true true quotes? I'm right. using quotes here. Right. The true essence that lies underneath it. Um and that's kind of what interests me at this point yeah. is trying to find what's the moon rather than the, than the finger. I find that the more, the more time people spend in martial arts, the more likely they are to come to that kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, here you are I'm doing the math close to 30 years, right? Yeah, yeah. right? Close to 30 years in. And because you've trained in different styles with a bunch of different people, you're starting to see, Hey, this Kempo and, and this Wushu, I mean, you could make arguments that Kempo is more of a Chinese art than a, a Japanese yeah. art. I mean, there's a whole discussion we could have we on could, that. We could go into that for a while. <laughs> but, but I think anybody would agree that they're pretty different. Yeah. But yet there's still enough overlap that you start to look and go, wait a second. There's a lot of similarities here. And then you start to learn other things. You know, maybe you go learn, you know, Kyokushin, mm -hmm. you know, brutal hard japanese style and you say wait a second there's some similarities in there too and the best analogy i've heard on the subject and, and i've heard multiple people share this with me the idea that martial arts is a mountain mm -hmm. and you start at the bottom and we can be on the opposite sides of the mountain and really far away but the further we get the closer we get yeah yeah totally agree i mean you look at and this comes back to like the inspiration part. You look at great martial artists that are, you know, getting closer to the top of the mountain, as you would say. Yeah. They have so many more similarities than they do differences, I feel. Yes, I agree. Are strategies maybe slightly different? Are there styles that emphasize one thing more than another? Yes, of course there are, because we're all different. We're all, you know, how I approach um, music might be totally different than how you might approach music. That's okay, but there's for music, does it give you a certain feeling? Does you know, does it give you a response? Yeah. For martial arts, is it giving you the certain response that you're looking for? And we can only move in so many ways as human beings. <laughs> you know? And only so many of those make sense in under the lens of combat. That, exactly. Yeah. So we're we're all gonna get to that same spot. But the, the the worst part is is if you only are in your one viewpoint the entire time and you stop <laughs> at, the, at the base of the mountain or halfway up the mountain right. then you won't get there so this that's the whole thing of like continuing the journey it's it's all a journey yeah we just have to keep continuing it awesome yeah, yeah totally if you could train with someone that you haven't mm. Anybody, anywhere in the world, any style, anywhere in time, you know, let's say we invent a time machine and you can go back. Who would you want to train with? Um, there's so many great martial artists that I'd, I, I mean, just in general, yeah. I love pulling ideas and hearing how somebody explains, maybe, like I was saying earlier about the light bulb all of a sudden going off, that aha moment, yeah. right? That thing that you might be doing and your instructor's been saying all the time, you hear it slightly from somebody else just a little bit differently, all of a sudden goes click, and you're able to now perform it, and you go, oh wow, that makes sense now. <laughs> I understand it. Yeah. And it's just because it's said slightly differently, or maybe it was presented slightly differently, and that's that's great. That's gonna enhance your, your martial arts. Um, as you said, Jeremy Fu, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's gonna enhance you. So. I, I love training. I, I love training. So <laughs> training with anybody would be great. But as far as historically, Sun Lutong, who is the, the, the founder of um, 
uh, sun style Tai Chi. Um, so oftentimes we talk about, you know, five major, again, these are, there are hundreds of styles of Tai Chi, but five major branches of Tai Chi. Um, and sun style is one of those five. Um, Why is, him? What about him? Why him? Why him? Because, um, not only was he just somebody who was good at his one style, he was also somebody who was really good in a bunch of styles before he even studied Tai Chi. Mm. So um, he was a uh, Xingyi and Bagua master mm. well before he was a, a Tai Chi master. Like, he developed Sun style Tai Chi, I think, I and I don't quote me on this as far as you know exact times, but no. I, from what I understand, it was in his late 50s by the time he started really working on Tai Chi. Um, and he's kind of one of the first people to to pull the idea of internal martial arts. So this Xing Yi Bagua and Tai Chi have these similarities to them. Um, and I think it would be interesting to understand his, his perspective. He, the idea that his, he, from what I've heard, he, he, he found that his Tai Chi was his crowning achievement mm. because it kind of combines elements of his other martial arts into the Tai Chi and kind of where he came from, how he came about that. More the thought process. That's that's what I'd like to understand a little bit more. Because you know I study Sun style Tai Chi, but I'd want to understand how he got there and and the ideas because this is like early nineteen hundreds. Okay, so not that long ago. Not that long ago, and a lot of times in in China, this is considered the golden age of martial arts. Um, for a movie perspective, hey, uh, have you ever seen? Uh, is it Fearless? With Jet Li? With, with Jet Li, yeah. right? Um, where there's like, you know, the, the bunch of different styles of Kung Fu and they're all like competing on, on the, uh, uh, um, and on like a stage, right? Yeah. And then they can get knocked off and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's the era. Okay. And so, and, and you had these influences, outside influences from the West, from Japan, that were starting to change culture a little bit. And so they wanted to kind of hold on to their culture and their ideas. So this, he was instrumental in also starting um, some of the, the sports academies, some of the martial arts academies, where it was pulling masters from various styles together into one location. And I would assume around that time that wasn't common, maybe even unheard of. Yeah, and, and he was also one of the first to um, do a lot of writing and publishing mm. of his stuff, um, which, again, controversial at the time. Yeah. You know, that's kind of almost like, you know... How dare you share this with share anyone it? who can read? It, yeah, I mean, that was like the internet of today, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so... That I would like to see his thought process because he he also was um, you know the the philosophies the Chinese philosophies of um, of Taoism of of uh, the Tao Te Ching and all that kind of stuff really are all tied very tightly and being just a fly in the wall even on his discussions with other martial arts master, masters must have been just fun to listen to. I'm sure. Yeah, I find it fascinating how plenty of people start in. Let's call them hard styles or external styles. Mm -hmm. And they transition into internal or softer. And I've never met, and I'm sure there are, but I've never met anyone who did the opposite. <laughs> I've never met anyone who did 15 years of Tai Chi and said, you know what? I'm going to go learn Taekwondo. Well, I, I think that's just because we're, we're all getting older. <laughs> and we're not all going to be doing a uh, jump spin hook kick. <laughs> or, sure turning kick to the side of the head yeah. uh, when we're, we're 70 years old. So, um, man, I, I wish I could be doing it. <laughs> Jump spin kick when I'm 70 years old. I hope so. That would be fun. Maybe, maybe, maybe you will. Maybe I will. Um, but yeah, I, I would say it allows you to practice and continue your practice 
yeah. even though you might not be in the fastest shape of your life or the fittest shape of your life. Um, but it still allows you to get your benefits yep. from your martial arts training. And I, I personally just, you know, Tai Chi Chuan is, is grand ultimate fist. That's what it's referred to. And the whole thing is that it's centered around principles. It's not like, oh, I'm learning how to do just one specific punch or one specific move. It's how your whole body is working together hmm. and it has to stay within the principles of, of yin and yang. So it's kind of, you know, every single move in a Tai Chi form has those components. Hmm. When you work with your, with your partner and you're doing push hands, it has those components to it. It never loses it. And if you lose it, all of a sudden you're not doing Tai Chi anymore. So, so it, you know, I, I like things that also work on principles. And so that whole idea of having principle or concept-driven martial arts really is what I'm into at this point. And, you know, every, every part of my life I've had different things I'm into. And that's what I love about the martial arts. If you're not feeling it one day <laughs> or you're getting bored for some reason, it means you're not looking hard enough. You're not digging deep enough. Um, if you if you look harder or deeper, or even simply just oh, I'm going to change and work on weapons, that can inform your other training, yeah. right? And it just gives you again a different lens or different perspective to see it through. Um, so, getting bored with my training, um, I I tend not to. I tend to just kind of shift a little bit, and then that inspires me again to train harder, train again more. And it reflects and influences my my core. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, but besides Sun Lutong, there's there's some contemporary people that you know I like for certain things. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do too too much of of the sword Japanese sword arts. You know, I've I've done. A, a little bit. I, I have a, a katana form that I play with once in a while that I've learned. But um, uh, Sensei Kuroda out of Japan, okay. just, again, when you see intent and you can see how a person moves mm. with grace and fluidity and flow, and that, that's inspiring. And that's not even like any style that I'm any closely related to. But I see it there, yeah. and and um, that would be a, a fun fun conversation. Um, as far as you know, I'd like my martial art to also be practical. I don't know. If, I know you said you did competitions, right? Mm -hmm. um, did you get to the point in like let's call it the late nineties, early two thousands, when all of a sudden people would go from let's say they're doing a, like a comma routine and. They do do a, their finishing strike, then they walk over to the corner, like literally walk to the corner, set it up, do a front handspring into a backflip or a back flash kick, and then land. Basically, reposition themselves in the middle of the ring again, start doing the comp form, reposition to the corner, do another gymnastic set. Yeah, yeah. I I so I've got just enough years on you that I stepped out. Yeah. Just before that happened, and I've seen it, and it is really it is an interesting thing. It is a a very big dichotomy between the ability to say this form has an entirety based around practical application, mm -hmm. and this form maybe has some practical application, but is also heavily modified and and without excuse for presentation. Yeah. And. And I'm okay with the whole presentation thing. It's it's almost like if you divide your personality, right? Mm. If you start having a conversation and then all of a sudden your personality changes completely halfway through and then it changes again, yeah. it's kind of disruptive, right? Um, when you have a form and you're doing the martial arts component, but then all of a sudden you break to do just some tricks, then you go back to the form, then you break to do tricks. That kind of lost me at that point. And that's when I started doing more of the, the wushu tournaments. And, yeah. and at that point, the wushu tournaments still had kung fu. They still had what it 
the, the actual technique, yeah. you know, was still there. Yes, was there a butterfly kick or a butterfly twist kick once in a while popped in? Yeah, but it was still martial arts driven. And it was within a sequence of other, other things. martial arts and, movies. And I know because I also got back into the, into the NASCA stuff um, for a couple of years while I was in college. Mm-hmm. And by that point, things have, had changed. And then it started being where you incorporated your trick into your form and everything became tight sequences combined all together. That makes sense, right? Because yeah. that has flow, that has purpose behind it. Um, even if you're throwing some crazy trick in there at the yeah. same time. <laughs> um, and then at that exact same moment, the Wushu tournament started doing the exact same thing. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so in uh, uh, like 2008-ish, you would see it where all of a sudden they'd stop their form, reset themselves somewhere else in the corner, and do very much like what was happening 10 years earlier in the NASCAR tournaments. Weird. It was very strange. And, and, and then it all became very points-driven, like, um, like you'd see in a, um, um, like a uh, gymnastics competition yeah. um, for floor exercise or for ice skating competitions, where if you do a certain trick, you get a certain amount of points extra if you mess the trick up a, a little bit you get deductions yep. there are certain required tricks you have to do within your form and that was all basically trying to get ready for the what was hope that it was going to be in the 2008 olympics yep. um but that's when i kind of left the competition end of of the wushu training because it just became can you pull off the trick that was that was the heavy part Compared to, and that's why I like Master Who is even though he was a, it was Wushu, it was very traditional intent behind what was doing. It was rooted in it was, in, it was in kung fu. It was rooted. It was kung fu because he was you know, he was in the group of that came over to present Wushu in martial arts to Nixon. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was in the first group. Yeah. you know that presented martial arts to the world basically, um, yeah. along with he was in. Um, like um, uh, the Shaolin Temple movie um, with Jet Li. Nice. Um, and also in several other movies with Jet Li and Sammo Hung and all that kind of stuff. Nice. So that was also another added benefit. We, we got to meet the, some of these. I never met Jet Li, but I got to meet Sammo Hung. Nice. Um, uh, I love him. Ma- uh, Master uh, Yu Cheng Wei, uh, very famous for two handed um, straight sword. Um, long beard. He was in some of the old kung fu movies, and he always had this long, either dark black or white beard in the movies. Eventually, as he got older, he was this beautiful white beard. Like you'd think of this <laughs> Taoist on a mountain. That's yeah. you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, it was kind of neat because we got the uh, Gordon Liu, another one from like Thirty Six Chambers of Shaolin. So we got to meet and, and also do some of their training because these guys were were martial artists as well you know they 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 didn't they weren't actors first martial artists second um they were martial artists first actors second (laughs) you know it's still that kind of that time period you didn't have all the cgi (laughs) sure sure. um but yeah it was um it it was one of those things where got I, i got to have some excellent experiences through through working with master who and um, got to go to China several times and cool. um, trained with the Zhejiang Wushu team. And, you know, I found out a lot about myself. Um, like what? Like, I was good at competing. Um, I, I've, I've done well <laughs> for myself. Mm-hmm. I'm, uh, I'm not somebody who, who, who brags or, or boasts. It's not me. Talking about myself tends to be harder for me. It's not my forte normally but if you objectively performed well and, yeah. and, and received awards i mean we can we can kind of leave it at that well, yeah so i like training what was hard for me is i learned kind of the limitations that my body would be allowed to take mm. um we you know while we were there training before the tournament which is about you know a month of training before the tournament it was up early (laughs) you had training session one at eight o'clock till basically noon Mm. break for lunch afternoon training slot for an hour or two break for dinner and then 
an evening, more, more learning experience. So it was a little bit lighter of a workout, but he was still working out, <laughs> you know, in training. Doing that day in, day out, seven days a week. Wow. Um, That's a lot. Yeah, I, I, I've, I learned about what my body was willing to take. Um, it just I started not benefiting my body anymore. It started yeah. breaking it down yeah. rather than having some like rest days built into it. How old are you at this time? Uh, this would be like um, college okay. um, and late high school. Okay. Like, so even still times. early, but if, if yeah. anybody who, who might be listening that hasn't dug in may not know that a lot of Chinese athletics start at like age three. Oh, like yeah. I mean, you, it's, it's, you are taken from your parents. Mm-hmm. Your parents are compensated. And you are on this track, and that is what you do. Yeah. So um, you didn't have that 15 or so years experience building up your body to be able to handle that level of training. Yeah, it was, it was, it was tough training. Um, it was fun training. It was just I, I learned that my body does better with and, – and this is what you have to figure out for yourself. You know, Everybody has a schedule or routine that is better for you. Yeah. Um, Mine is not every day, you know, <laughs> that, that level of intensity. Um, and, or like stretching at that level, like, like force stretching, like you get down in that front split and, and as low as you, yeah. Ow. Multiple times over the day that, you know, m- your muscle doesn't recover. So I went to college for um, sports and exercise science, basically. And that was one of the studies we were working on was, Let's say if you're going to do a performance-based activity, something really where uh, you have to perform ballistic movements. Okay. If you stretch, like um, static stretching before that for an extended amount of time, you're actually going to reduce your ability to, to contract and be able to be on your best performance. Okay. Um, and, and so I think th- some of those overtraining moments led to not being able to benefit and progress the skill as much as I wanted to in that amount of time where sometimes having those breaks in there really allows my training to, to, to feel like I'm gaining yeah. having gains off of it. Your body grows and adapts in the healing process, not in the breaking down exactly. process. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I learned a lot about myself uh, through, through that sure. training, but it, it was, it was just an amazing time to, to be able to, to train in China at a high level, be able to, to be part of the culture, nice. which, which is just fantastic. When you look out over the next however long, I won't put a time frame on it, but just the future, your future with mm-hmm. the martial arts, what has you excited? What has me excited? Um, I'm excited to keep learning and growing just in anything um, and re-examining my martial art and what what I'm looking from it and looking to get from it. Um, I would love to to um, do some additional training and, and going around and just experiencing, you know, other people. And um, right now, I, I don't know if we were on tape or when we were recording this, if we caught it, but, you know, I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old, so it's a little hard to get away from the house as much <laughs> as I, I'd want to, to go to get some seminars and all that kind of stuff, but um, I'd love to be able to, to get back into that again a little yeah. bit more, um, and then my primary focus is, is looking at my teaching and trying to give my students the best that I can do for mm-hmm. them. Um, whether, and re-examining how I teach it or what I'm teaching, how I can present it a little bit better, um, how I can dig a little bit deeper for them, do it in maybe a slightly different way. I like playing with things like that. Um, but I really, that my, my goal is my students at this point and nice. trying, to, trying to help them to become the best, not just martial artists that they can be, but also the best human beings they can mm. be. Um, and and that, that drives me every day. Um, and then I have a lot of little goals of, of um, you know, being able to get some of our, our material on, on video so that they can have a little bit more assisted knowledge, not learning from video, but so that they can reference it. Supplement. Oh, yeah, to supplement what they're doing. Um, 
and we do a we do a uh, performance bi yearly show, um, where which is something again from you know growing up in a performance you know my yeah. my dad being music teacher and and theater director that kind of I like martial arts in that scene more so than in competition even though I did a bunch of competition I like the idea of showing and demonstrating martial arts and for our students having a place where they can present something and be supported everybody there is going to love it no matter yeah. what happens it's cool so they're going to have that support no matter what but they're still training to do their best you know it, it's the same training as competition but no matter what you're not going to have oh i failed yeah because it's the best of both it's the best of both it, you know some people and me i'm one of those people <laughs> um not doing well in the competition makes you want to drive harder yep. other people it breaks them yeah um and and that's that that can be tough but it's just a different way of presenting it and um that that's one of the things we do in our school which i find fun cool yeah um and then uh just connecting with other martial artists that's that's where i'm at <laughs> I, can, I can certainly empathize that desire yeah i mean that's Turn it into a job. It's fun. <laughs> I get to call this work, right? It's, That's right. It's pretty awesome. If people want to look you up online, find your school, social media, you know, anything like that, what, where should we send them? Um, MountMansfieldMartialArts.com is our website. Uh, you can pretty much contact us any way through that. Um, our phone number's on there. Email's on there. That'd probably be the easiest. Cool. Cool. And of course... Um, if people are listening and driving in the car, some people will link that. If people are new to the show, it's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That might be easier. Or the Mount Mansfield Martial Arts dot com is also pretty darn easy to it's remember. It's pretty, pretty easy. No, well, if you no, live in Vermont, it's pretty easy yeah, to remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no hyphens or anything yeah. silly like that. Awesome. Um, thanks for doing this. And just one one last thing as we as we head out the door with it, you know, some parting advice for the people listening. All right. Um, I always talk to my students when they're getting ready for black belt. I like to see that they become thinking martial artists, that they're not just puppets, <laughs> right? Um, so if you can think about what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, how you can improve it, what concepts, what ways you're doing something can enhance your practice, that's going to that's gonna enhance your training. And it'll be more than just just practicing kicks and punches. Yeah. Um, and hopefully, if, if you're applying that to your martial arts, it's also applying to to your life in general, and um, allowing you to become a better person. Because I think I think you've said it before, where you know most martial artists are, are good people. I like to think so. Yeah, yeah I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jeremy. This has been great. Awesome. Thanks. One of the coolest things about this show is that I get to go to people that I know or maybe want to know better and say, hey, will you sit down and talk with me? Well, it makes for good content, but it also means I get to know more about who they are, which enhances my friendships with them, which makes me more excited to train with them or, or just really interact with them in, in any way, whether it be martial arts or not. And this was one of those examples where I got to know a friend of mine even better. So. Sifu Grainer, thank you so much for your openness, for your time coming on the show. Hope to see you soon. If you want to check out the show notes with some photos and other stuff that we have to give you more context to this episode, head to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Sign up for the newsletter while you're there. We send it out, you know, once or twice a month just to let you know what's going on. Maybe throw you a discount on some products that we've got. Tell you about new things that we have coming. If you want to find us on social media, we are at Whistlekick. Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter are our primary outlets, but of course, we do post some things on YouTube. If you want to email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com is the best way. And that's also the best way to let us know about guest suggestions or topic suggestions or just feedback for the show. I love to hear from listeners. That's all I've got for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>